you all for joining us on this beautiful Saturday afternoon. Um, my name is Yasser Ali. I am an estate planning attorney based in Phoenix, Arizona, and your host today. And most people, when we think about estate planning, we think about inheritance, we think about post-death transfers. And that's a lot of what we do in our practice is help clients think about how do we preserve wealth and assets and how, we, how do we transfer them efficiently and in a way that avoids the court system and minimizes taxes and is uh, Sharia compliant. That's a lot of what we do with our clients. But today we're going to be talking about a component of estate planning that's very important, often neglected, and one that impacts almost everybody and some facet either directly themselves or in the care and context of support for a loved one. So I'm very excited uh, to have with me my dear friend, Dr. Rami Salah. Uh, just briefly, so you guys know, Dr. Rami and I go back. Alhamdulillah, I met him when I was a first year law student at UC Berkeley. And I believe, Rami, you were the president of the MSA at the time. Uh, <laughs> so we had a That's lot of fun at Berkeley. Um, and Alhamdulillah, Dr. Rami is uniquely qualified to talk about end of life. And he is a hospice and palliative care physician in the Bay Area. I'm going to let him tell you what that means and, and, and what that entails. But mashallah, he went to Berkeley. He went on to go to med school and residency at UCLA. And now he's practicing back at home in the Bay Area as a hospice and palliative care physician. And Rami, I think I have met thousands of Muslim doctors and you are the only Muslim physician that I have met who is a hospice and palliative care physician. So why don't we start with, uh, tell us a little bit about what that means and what that entails and what do you do? And then inshallah, we will, uh, we will get more into the webinar. Sure, sure. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. I just want to say uh, that this has been a long time coming between Yasin and I, and I'm glad that we were able to finally do it. And I'm glad that you took time out of your Saturday to everybody on the call uh, to learn about this. Um, you're right, there's not many Muslim palliative care physicians. We're, we're out there. I've met a few, a handful. Um, but it's a unique field. Uh, it's as old as medicine is how I like to describe it, because at some point, in history, the best we could do were things that were palliative, essentially relieve suffering, address pain and symptoms. And as technological and medical advancements came to be over the last century and a half, uh, we lost sight of that uh, and focused more on life prolonging um, treatments, which are important. I'm glad we have them. But palliative care, especially here in the States, made a resurgence in the last, you know, like the last quarter of the century. Uh, the 20th century, and now it's become an accredited uh, field in medicine. Yasser asked me to to share what differentiates me as a palliative physician compared to, say, an intensivist in the ICU or in the emerg an emergency room doc who, you know, probably is around death quite a bit. Uh, and I think one of the things that I like to say as palliative care uh, clinicians, physicians, what we do is try to see the forest through the trees, right? Um, to focus on big picture. We specialize in communication, difficult conversations. I often tell my patients that I'm here to learn about you as a person and not just a patient, uh, so that your treatments are, uh, or excuse me, your wishes are honored with your treatments. Um, so without further ado, if it's okay, if I pull up my slides here, I do have um, some slides to share and go through with you. Uh, sure. I just have before to- Before we do that, before we do that, Dr. Ami, I wanna talk just, uh, just set the stage a little bit for this uh, for this conversation that we're going to have today, because it's so important. Um, as I mentioned directly, there is uh, a large like or a high percentage, or, or and you can talk about you know what percentage of people will face some component of incapacity and diminished capacity or inability to make their own decisions, um, and then thinking about who's going to make them for you and what voice will that person have? Uh, so I think that's one component. And then there's so many people who are tasked with mm -hmm. either intentionally or unintentionally uh, the decision making for a loved one and that stressful process of how to make decisions when there was no guidance given. And so I think that's what a lot of people will be looking for. But one more thing that's just so important as Muslims is that this is a core component of our deen. 
you know, our whole, our whole faith is framed around thinking about death and constantly being in the remembrance of death and preparing for death. And the Prophet ﷺ mentions in a hadith, you know, remember the destroyer of pleasures. And, you know, we go about our daily life generally not thinking about death. And if we did, I mean, it's not intended to paralyze a person to not function, but it's healthy to think about death. And what's so fascinating is that, especially within a bunch of our cultures, our cultures, ironically, more so than the general public, and feel free to tell me if this is anecdotally true in your experience, people think if I talk about death, I'm going to die. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, how many amus and uncles think that if I start talking about death, then I'm going to die. And so the better thing is to not talk about it, whereas it's such a core component and leaving people behind with no idea what you would want or leaving your decisions to healthcare workers that you've never met, I mm -hmm. think is crazy. But I just want to just emphasize that frame for just a moment that even when we think about other things besides this narrow discussion point, which is to say there's a hadith of the Prophet Wasallam that he says that, you know, a time will come where people will be feasting upon Muslims. And, you know, the Sahaba asked that, you know, will we be women Like, will we be very few in number? Is that the reason why people will look at Muslims and just kind of, you know, view them as as as, as free to take on the dinner table? And the Prophet says, no, but antum yawma idhin kathir, that you'll be so many but your value is like the foam of the sea. And the hadith continues on about why. And the final point there is that it's because people will have wahan, which is hubbud dunya wa karahiyatul maut. It's this love for this world and just a, you know, hatred for death. And like, if we think about the problems in the ummah and we think about how focused we are on our day-to-day -day life and not thinking about death, this frame, even though we're thinking about it from the practical you know, medical side, it's just, it helps orient and live our life in a purposeful manner. So I want to just lay that framework out for today and then talk, uh, and then I'll let you, I'll, I'll hand it over to you just so everyone knows, inshallah, just a couple administrative housekeeping notes. Uh, you are free to ask questions in the chat. So if you have any questions as they come up, ask in the chat, we'll do our best to address them. Uh, I won't promise that we'll get to everything. There's a lot of material um, and we want to be respectful of your time. So we're going to take about an hour, inshallah, to try to cover the topics for today's program. If we don't get through things, inshallah, we can have another conversation or you can reach out to us if it's something more, uh, you know, that you want to address. But we're going to cover a little bit about palliative care and hospice, as, as Dr. Rami alluded to his work and what that entails. Then we're going to look at what does death look like and, you know, how do people die and where do they die um, and some statistics around that. And then I think most interesting, uh, Dr. Rami is going to present four case studies. So we're going to move from theory to practice, where we have these abstract concepts of death and dying and, uh, you know, directives and DNRs and all of that, and then move them into actual real life examples so that that will help you to think about how to make these decisions. And then finally, at the end, we'll come back and talk about making sure that we have a plan, right? So that it's not just left in the abstract but that we actually focus on creating our own advanced directives and living wills and how to do that, inshallah. So without further ado, I will go ahead and pass it over to Dr. Rami. All right, bismillah. You know, I, I wanna start off like with any talk uh, with a couple of disclaimers as well. And if I wanted, if I could really give all the disclaimers I wanted to give, I think it'd take the better part of this um, talk. But the main important ones are, number one, I'm here uh, in my capacity as a doctor, first and foremost, although, of course, we'll pull on Islamic teachings and traditions, and I find inspiration in them, as well as studies and academics uh, and ethics. Uh, I'm mostly here as a doctor. That being said, none of this is medical advice, right? Uh, personal medical advice. And lastly, what uh, the second thing I wanted to share was what Yasser talked about, is that we're talking a little bit about a lot of things. When we met to prepare for today, yeah, so it kept going about, you know, talk about this, make sure you talk about this, don't forget that. And when I looked at my notes at the end of our pre-meet, it was a whole page. I said, yes, you've given me like five, six hours worth of uh, material to cover. So it is scratching the surface on a lot of things. This, this talk is academic as well as religious, as well as medical, as well as ethical. And so it touches on all those 
uh, components around this important topic uh, of end of life care. Rami, so, before, before yeah. you go on, just uh, I have to echo that disclaimer that this is also not legal advice. Um, you know that, you know, I am a lawyer, not your lawyer in this process until we engage. And so our goal is really to help you understand these concepts. Uh, and then inshallah, if you would like further assistance in preparing the documents, we can help you with that separately. But our goal today is a general overview as Dr. Rami alluded to. So by the end of this talk, I'm just listing a couple objectives that you're going to be able to do. First, we're gonna talk briefly about the field of palliative care and how that's differentiated with hospice. Uh, it's often conflated by the general public, but even people in the medical field uh, don't get the differences. Um, we'll talk about picking a good healthcare agent and the four qualities that I list that make a good one. We'll talk about themes around redemptive suffering, harms, and autonomy around from an Islamic viewpoint. This is more cerebral a uh, part of the talk. In terms of practical stuff, we'll talk about the two forms that come up for many people at the end of life, and not necessarily end of life, but just talking about it, advanced directive and the physician order for life-sustaining treatment forms. Um, those are often confused as well. And throughout my talk, and perhaps the most important thing, is that we will draw on inspiration from the best example, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and how he lived his last days on earth, uh, how he dealt with serious illness, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and I think whenever we lose our focus in these decisions, we can go back to the sunnah of Rasulullah to get that inspiration and to kind of refocus us. So first, what is palliative care? You know, palliative care is, is a very misunderstood term. People often think about death, dying, end of life with palliative. Uh, it's a very hard word to say just physically with the tongue. I'm not a huge fan of it. It was coined in 75 by the surgeon in Canada. And it comes from the word cloak, right? And just like that, we're here to relieve suffering, you know, wrap around people, keep them warm when it gets cold, essentially. This is the Center to Advance Palliative Care's definition of it. And when we're talking about palliative care and hospice, the first sentence talks about the similarities and the second sentence talks about the differences. So the first sentence is for patients or people living with serious illness. So in my practice, I'm seeing patients with advanced cancer, heart failure, uh, lung disease, uh, renal disease, dementia, et cetera. And our main goal is to improve quality of life, not just for the patient, but for their circle as well. And we take a holistic approach. We say physical, psychosocial, emotional, spiritual care, all in palliative care. And hospice does that too as a team. The difference, though, is that palliative is dependent on the needs of a patient and not the prognosis. Prognosis is a term that usually is used to sh share life expectancy, how long a person has left to live. And the hospice benefit in the United States, at least for most populations, you have to have at least a six month or less prognosis to be enrolled with hospice care. So palliative can be involved at any age and any point, and it can be delivered with curative treatment. What does that mean? In hospice, uh, patients will forego certain medical interventions like chemotherapy for a cancer a patient with cancer or hospitalizations. They usually don't want to see the inside of a hospital again. With palliative, those can be concurrent. And this is highlighted in this graph, essentially. Palliative care is best delivered when we get involved upstream. That's when you have the best outcomes with improved quality of life, better conversations, better end of life outcomes. So it's good to get us involved early on. There's just a lot of barriers sometimes, and usually they're cultural or societal barriers uh, that prevent us from getting involved when we'd want to. And the focus of palliative versus disease-directed therapies change over the course of an illness. And so finally, towards the end, usually it's more about relieving comfort uh, until um, uh, patients enroll with hospice if they're at the end of life, or sometimes they're cured of their disease and they go on. I always like mentioning this study. I'll mention a couple studies today, uh, medical studies. This is uh, one that palliative care clin clinicians really love. And I think it highlights many points, not just medical uh, issues, but also kind of puts contextualizes end of life care and the murkiness around it. This was done in 2010 when stage four non-small cell lung cancer, people with that diagnosis usually lived on the order of months. They didn't really make it past a year. Now with immunotherapy, things have changed, alhamdulillah. 
Uh, but what they did here in 2010 was they divided 150 odd patients between standard of care to and then also to uh, early palliative care, seeing palliative care within two weeks of diagnosis. Um, and what that team was was pretty bare bones. I believe it was just a nurse practitioner and a social worker in a clinic, and they didn't see the patient very often. In my practice, we have a doctor, nurse practitioners, social workers, chaplains, nurse coordinators, and we do home visits. So ours is more robust and probably one of the more robust palliative care clinics that you'll see. Um, and what did they see in terms of outcomes? Well, number one, their quality of life scores improved with palliative care. That's not surprising. You have a team focusing on this stuff. You're going to have better quality of life scores. Their mood scores improved as well, especially with depression went down with early palliative care. Again, not surprising. But the surprising part of this study is that patients with early palliative care, though they had uh, less chemotherapy in the last two weeks of life, less ICU stays, fewer ICU stays in the last uh, weeks of life, and more likely to sign on to hospice care sooner, they lived longer. The difference here was an average of 2.7 months. And although that might not sound like a lot to most people, like 2.7 months, for this population, I, I describe it as a lifetime. And if you'd see a chemotherapy that showed 2.7 month survival in this population, you'd see it in the commercials uh, in your Sunday football games. I mean, that's that's how big a deal that was. Now, I don't say this to say get palliative care. It's going to prolong your life because I'll be honest, the main goal of palliative care is not to prolong people's lives. I'd love to see that. But the main goal is to improve quality of life, to address symptoms, um, to have tough conversations, and to make sure the care people get matches the care people want. And of course, that's derived with things like values, religion, uh, priorities, goals, etc. So really quickly, just to summarize this portion, palliative care focuses on symptom relief, quality of life, patients with serious illness at any age and any stage hospice, truly end-of-life care, and focus on comfort uh, for, uh, where, where certain interventions are um, foregone. So now I'd like to pivot and talk about the landscape of dying. Uh, I usually start off my talks with this, and, and honestly, it's good to, to put it into context that you know every facet of life has drastically changed over the last century, right? We ha human beings haven't seen as much change as they have in all of human history, as they have in the last 50 to 100 years. I mean, and Allah only knows how it's going to look 100 years from now. And dying is no exception. And Yasser talked about this when we were framing this conversation. How our attitudes, unfortunately, though our tradition is rich, Rasulullah was generous in talking about how we should have this relationship with death and dying, right? When he talked about the wisest people, وسلم, he said, those who are abundant in the remembrance of death and the best in preparing for what's after it. But unfortunately, as a Muslim community, we weren't immune from uh, the, the unfortunate change in society and culture in our attitudes towards death. It's become medicalized. Dying is not a medical process, but it, it's a human one. It should be, inshallah, a spiritual one, but it's become a medical one, right? And it's also been a forbidden death, as Philip Aries puts it, something concealed, something far away. You think 150 years ago, death was, at least for us in America, we're privileged. We don't see death very often. But you can get, even in America, 150 years ago, children would see death all the time. Women would go into childbirth not knowing if they were going to come out or not. I mean, this was a part of daily life. And unfortunately, I think the medicalization of death, the concealment of death from society has, has led it to be a taboo topic, even though Islam teaches us otherwise. Uh, and so I'm hoping, you know, through this talk and through these slides, you become a little more comfortable with the topic, a little more comfortable in talking about it with your loved ones, especially. The first question about what does dying look like is how we die. And this is a graph looking at statistics from 2016 of all the causes of death, right? Between heart disease and lung disease and uh, sepsis and so forth. I think the more important graph, though, and this is for people 65 years or older, the more important graph is this. 70% of us, if we make it to 65, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us long lives, will die from a chronic illness. 
what is a chronic illness? A chronic illness is an illness that takes many months, sometimes many years, to uh, that people can live with until they eventually die. And I think, you know, a lifespan, despite the little blip with COVID, uh, lifespan has increased, right, with time. Um, but the disease-free years have not, meaning people are living longer than ever before, but it's because we're living longer with illness than ever before. So we're sicker, right, for longer. And I think chronic illness does one of two things. Ideally, it should put things into context, especially for us as Muslims. We're dealing with illness. Now our mortality is front and center, right? We are meeting, uh, we are getting ready. We're calling Yasser and getting our estate planning in order. We're, you know, figuring out our affairs. We're having these conversations. We're reconciling with family members and we're getting ready to meet Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah make the best days of the day we meet him. Uh, I mean, so that's what it should do. However, what it truly does, I think, in practice is it builds up this culture of denial as if we're going to live forever. These are four trajectories uh, with different disease processes. I won't get too into it, but I want you to focus on the top right there, the entry, re-entry loop. And this helps kind of deliver the point that I'm trying to make. That for a patient with heart failure, for example, heart failure is a condition where the heart is not pumping as well as it used to and fluid builds up in the body. There's a lot of strain on the heart and it's a serious illness, right? Uh, but what happens is, although the trajectory is one of decline over time, there are these moments where it gets really bad really quickly. Patients go to the hospital. Doctors are great at optimizing medications and dosages, tuning a person up and then discharging them back home, back to the baseline that they were at. And this can happen many times. The, the, the highest reason for admission to the hospital after infection is this, is heart failure. And it happens again and again and again until finally when it happens and doctors can no longer, medicines can no longer uh, bring a person back to baseline. And what I see in my practice often is, no, 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 this happened again like five times before. All you got to do is get the dosage right. This doctor doesn't know what they're talking about. That last doctor was able to optimize medications. Oh yeah, we had another doctor tell us we were he was going to die. And then now look at him three months later and he was able to get home. And so it gives this false sense of, you know, immortality really. Thinking where, you know, medicine is limitless in its ability to cure a person. We know the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, da in like for every illness is a treatment, so seek treatment. But we forget the second part of the hadith where Rasulullah says, Illa al -haram, except old age. And I believe in another narration, he mentions death. And so we have to be uh, aware of our, of our mortality. I think this is a, a, a good time to bring up one sunnah of dying. Uh, Rasulullah acknowledged that his time wasn't long in the world to those around him. You know, when we, he sent Mu'adh ibn Jabal anhu out, he said, when you'd come back to Medina, you'd be visiting my grave. So he shared that information. In one of his last sermons, he mentioned the story of a, a slave of Allah who was given the choice between Zahrat al-Dunya, the, the luxuries of this world, or that which is with Allah. And he chose that which is with him, with Allah. And we know his last word, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was Rafiq al-A'la, Rafiq al-A'la, choosing the higher companionship with Allah. And so acknowledging your dying, sharing that to the community that, you find important, usually your inner circle, your family, right, is a sunnah of dying from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and, and one that is lost. I think usually when I see it with families, it's uh, everyone knows it, but no one vo no one voices it. No one is able to say, you know, uh, this is happening, this is what I want, this is what's important, et cetera, et cetera. This Dr. Ami, before, before yeah. you uh, continue, I mean, this is beautiful, and subhanAllah, like, well, as you mentioned, our tradition is so rich here. I ironically think, and I'm sure that you deal with this on a more frequent basis than I do, uh, that perhaps other faith groups are actually more better prepared. Uh, I mean, you find a lot, and, and this is the point I made earlier, like we as Muslims in America, like there's no shortage of doctors. <laughs> Certainly, if there's an overrepresented group, it's physicians. Uh, but like by and large at the communal level, like we we're not prepared at all for for death. 
uh, so do you, do you, do you find the other faith groups have like more structure around this process? Obviously they're not thinking about Akhirah, but they are thinking about end of life a lot more, it seems. I think, um, more than faith groups, it's, and you can, we can delve into the demographics of the Muslim community in America. I think it has more to do with, you know, minority, uh, being a minority and also socioeconomic status. There's a huge level of mistrust. Rightfully so, I'm going to say, right? It's founded in in true institutional racism that minorities face when they go to the emergency department. And so there's a a wall, a curtain of of mistrust that we're starting from when the doctor talks to us or talks to mom or, or tells us this very devastating news that's founded in real real evidence of of racism and implicit bias. And so uh, there is a, a piece of privilege, you know, that that other faith groups maybe. Are, are more likely to be prepared. I think the same is true for estate planning, right? Um, people of privilege are more likely to get reach out to an estate attorney. People of privilege are actually more likely to get palliative care. It's, it's terrible. I, I wish it wasn't the case because I think some of our most underserved communities need it the most. Um, and so I think it's a that's a bigger topic. And yes, I think as a community, I, I feel good, uh, confident in saying, not good, confident in saying we're wholly unprepared for, for this stuff. Where we die is the second question. And uh, this was pulled in 2016 as well for patients older than 65. Uh, the remainder percentage, uh, emergency room clinics and other places are not included here. But the three most you know, uh, likely places that you and I and all of us will die are either in the hospital, number one there, a skilled nursing facility or a, a long-term care facility, number two, and then home. And uh, although with uh, time, thankfully, I think I could say, thankfully, more and more people are choosing and are able to die at home than in the hospital. Uh, I think that's a big discussion there. Um, but before I get into it, um, that is also rooted in the sunnah, right? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he first had the fever, he was at our mother Maymuna radiallahu anha's chamber. And when Ali al-Fadl radiallahu anhu um, brought him to the family and he asked the question, sallallahu alayhi, where shall I stay? Everyone knew that he was implying to stay with Aisha radiallahu anha. And so he moved from the chamber of Maymuna to Aisha, uh, the chamber of Aisha. And that was that choice, that choice of, of where to die is, is a practice in the sunnah. On top of that, although this is a loaded uh, comment here, um, dying at home uh, can be looked at as a sunnah. I remember I was in a talk where the sheikh mentioned that if there were any more honorable way to die than in, at home and in the arms of your loved one, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would have died that way. Now, I think um, there are a lot of angles that we have to discuss that. You know, uh, it's not always possible to die at home. And that's because what I said earlier, we're living with chronic illness longer. And so that's affecting our caregivers. We're, we're not, most of us are not just having a 10 to 14 day stint with high fevers and, and sepsis and infection. We're dealing with cancer for many years or dementia for many years where they need constant supervision. And so there have been studies showing that caregiver burnout and caregiver health, right? And how often they utilize hospitals and clinics actually go up when their loved one dies at home. And so, uh, Practically speaking, you know, many people have to either be or hire caregivers, and that's not cheap, especially here in the Bay Area, um, to actually achieve death at home. Um, it's not always easy. So I wanted to offer that, you know, that caveat there. All right. Just, just so now we'll go into there. the. Yeah, if go for it. Well, I think maybe one point that's, that's a really beautiful point you make, uh, which is to say the likelihood of that home death occurring in the absence of articulating that wish is probably going to be less than if that plan were were made in the directive or at least wishes articulated to family like i mean how is someone even supposed to know that that's a wish that someone has i think if you pulled people you'd find that most people would want that but how many people have articulated that wish i think very very few or put it down on paper. Put it down on paper, much less, but even just yeah. like a, a, a verbal conversation to that effect. There was a but good certainly on paper without question. There was a good article um, from years back from from one of my mentors uh, called "Rehab to Death," uh, and and we see this cycle um, at the end of life for older uh, patients. We may have seen it in our old families, 
where a patient goes from the hospital to nursing facility, home, then hospital, nursing facility, hospital, hospital facility, until finally they die. And, and it's mess. I mean, it's, it's stressful, uh, these transitions, and no one's having the conversation to say, all right, this is what's happening, what's important. And so that's a good segue to the first case here. Uh, and I think this applies probably to the majority of, of participants here. I don't know uh, who is on the call. I'm assuming most are Muslim. Probably most are are younger um, and maybe not dealing with serious illness. And if you are, may Allah make it easy. But this is a case of a 45-year-old year Muslim man who's otherwise healthy, and he does something that maybe probably most 45-year-old Muslim men don't do. They scheduled a, a regular checkup with his primary care doctor, and everything, alhamdulillah, checks out. Yeah, right? labs come back pristine. Everything is great. So the doctor says, you know, I think it's time to fill out an advanced directive. Yeah, she's being a good doctor. And the Muslim man says, I'm not filling that thing out. Only Allah knows when we die. Uh, so this is the thing that we we talked about a little bit earlier. It's talking about the future and dying going to actually make it happen. Right. So what is advanced care planning? Uh, Many people put a D on advanced. There's nothing advanced about this. This is actually better read backwards. It's planning for your care in advance. So you're thinking about the future. And the two real components of advanced care planning that I, I want to say is, number one, writing. things, Putting it in a document, an advanced directive that we'll talk about shortly. shortly. But more importantly is the conversations, right? The conversations that you're having with your spouses, with your children, if you're older, with whoever you designate as uh, as decision maker or healthcare agents. So one of the two things that an advanced directive, the document achieves is number one, it designates that healthcare agent that we talked about. Uh, and we'll go about that in the next slide. And number two, it writes down your preferences. That's the directive part. If time were short, if you were dealing with some irreversible condition and doctors thought time, you know, that death is imminent, how would you want your care to look like? What's important? And usually there are no shortage, unfortunately, maybe it makes it confusing, of the types of or versions of advanced directives. Each state and uh, has its own kind of requirements. So if you have a, if you're in California, you'd have to find a California one, Arizona, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then within each state, there's probably dozens and dozens and dozens of versions of, of advanced directives. And one thing that I think uh, would be that I've seen in other faith groups is an advanced directive that's legally valid, right, uh, and applicable, that really uses language that makes sense for us as Muslims, right? And we'll talk about some themes that come up at the end of life shortly that you can kind of have in in an advanced directive. Um, so uh, Robert, before I turn hey, it to- Let me yeah, jump in here for a second. I think that this point is so important that uh, there are so many directives and what's even more perhaps confusing for folks is that they, the, the, the studies show, you know, over 60% of people in America don't have a directive. And then the question is, okay, well, there's so many online resources that allow you to create a directive, but that doesn't necessarily facilitate because the directives have such complex language within them in terms of what interventions you would want or not want. And perhaps the irony is that you know the 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 logical place for this to happen is inside of a doctor's office where this doctor just made the advice to the patient to create a directive but that doesn't really happen and where this usually happens is in the lawyer's office right so in the context of creating an estate plan you'll find that any comprehensive estate plan includes a directive uh but the lawyer often is not well versed in the medicine either I mean, obviously, it has no 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 medical training, um, so it's just a really it's a really interesting space because most of these directives happen in I think the lawyer's office. Most people don't go to a lawyer, and so they never get done. And then the self help forms that are available uh, certainly they're not tailored to us. And inshallah, one of the goals that I really have, and and I was so excited to work with Dr. Rami on this webinar, is that inshallah our goal is to build uh, an Islamic. A directive that can be valid in all 50 states because all 50 states also have unique signing requirements. And so what happens so many times in estate planning in general is when people come to my office or contact me with self-help, they didn't execute the documents correctly. 
So if there's a notary requirement, perhaps they didn't get it notarized, or if there's two witnesses, they didn't get the witnesses, or like they got the witnesses, but they didn't do the witnesses and the notary at the same time when they were supposed to. And so you end up with an exercise that's incomplete and thus not legally valid. So there's so many barriers and inshallah, our goal is hopefully make dua uh, and we'll, we'll hopefully follow up with this, but to try to develop a directive, as you said, that's culturally competent addresses from the Islamic ethics perspective, you know, what type of care we would want and end of life that we can use in all 50 states that will produce and be state specific. So that's a goal inshallah that we have, uh, hopefully we'll work on. Yeah. Um, so that's an advanced directive. You're absolutely right. Yeah, so the most people do not have advanced directives. And um, studies show that if you are admitted to the hospital uh, for patients, this was for patients over 65, there is a more than likely chance that someone else is going to have to make a medical decision for you. And that has happened within the last three days of life. Mm. So literally life and death decisions are are usually, you know, it, are void. I would say be made voiced by your healthcare agent. Inshallah, I mean, you had already made decisions or have given a guide around these decisions to that healthcare agent before they're called to task. So this is a good time to visit what a healthcare agent is. Um, they're also called uh, decision makers. They're also called durable powers of attorney for healthcare, uh, healthcare proxy. There's, there's a lot of words for it, but essentially it's who would you want to make medical decisions on your behalf if and when uh, you are unable to make them on your own? Um, some people, actually, even though they're able to make those decisions on their own, already appoint somebody else. And I think Western clinicians uh, or, or Western trained clinicians have a hard time with that when mom says, just ask my son and I don't want to know about my diagnosis. And they're saying, no, you have to know that's an autonomous decision and we have to honor that as long as she's asked the question, do you want to know or do you want your son to handle this or or, or hear about this? Um, there are four qualities that I like to use. Uh, the first is that they know they are a healthcare agent or they're listed as a healthcare agent and you would be surprised how many people list their brother, their cousin, their friend, and that person has no clue. I'm actually dealing with a case right now with a patient who who doesn't have capacity listed five people on an advanced directive some years ago, and none of the five want to serve in that role. And so we're, it's, it's a mess now. And so you have to say, wife, husband, child, friend, you're my durable power of attorney. Are you okay with that? And guess what? If they say no, alhamdulillah, you found that out before they were actually called, you know, to pull the plug or, or what have you. Um, so that's number one. Number two is that they're available, reachable and reliable, right? They don't necessarily have to be living in the same area, although that sometimes that's the ideal scenario. But don't give me the cousin or the friend who's traveling or who never picks up the phone. They got to be reliable and reachable. Number three is that they know your wishes. So I said already, these conversations, hey, did you see how auntie died? I would never want that for myself. Did you see how um, Baba you know, went through his treatments? That's something I would want for myself if I was ever tried that way. These are the conversations to have with that loved one or, or healthcare agent. And then last but not least is they have what I call the emotional fortitude or wherewithal to make decisions on your behalf and not what they think you know, they want or they would want for themselves or they would want for you. Uh, I give the example of, of me and my brother, right? Uh, my father chose me as a healthcare agent. Uh, and my brother, even though he's older, we know that he would have a hard time with illness. He gets anxious around illness. So he would serve in a lot of better roles than I would. But for healthcare decisions, better to leave to me, right? Or better to have me listed there. So that's important to know as well. So just to recap that they know they're reachable, reliable, and available. They know your wishes, that they know their healthcare agent, they're reachable, reliable. They know your wishes, and then they have the emotional fortitude to act on them. Yes, sir? Yeah, that's something to say. Uh, so we see this all the time, and in fact, I was as you were talking, I was kind of smiling because uh, we've had uh, clients name you as the agent, and I don't know if they asked you or not for permission. <laughs> Me? Oh gosh! <laughs> and so, so, but I get this all the time. Like people like to appoint their imam, for example, and I always say no. And I'm like, you know, the poor guy. Imagine he has you know, a hundred people who he's supposed to be the healthcare agent for, not to mention that the imam generally has no training in any of these, you know, in, in, in these, in these situations. And so I think it's really, really, really important to pick the right people. Um, so many times 
you know, you want, when we go back to your, your, your notion of like a spiritual death, you want death to be a time of Quran, a, a, a time of dua, people are surrounding you like that are that, but instead, I mean, there's so many times and situations where people are just fighting and, mm -hmm. and you know, what could be worse at, at that moment? And so the careful thought about who you're designating and accessibility, you could then tell that person, hey, listen, before you make a decision, I want you to make shura with such and such other people, but don't put the burden of reaching them if they're not available, right? Whether that's somebody yeah. overseas or someone who is the, you know, the, the local sort of leader or the, the, the Muslim doctor, right? Or the imam or whatever. Um, but I think that's important. And then perhaps one more thing, this might be a little offensive in cases, but Sometimes it's just important, which is like, if there's one person you definitely don't want to be making decisions, I think you should articulate that as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know it sounds offensive, but like, if this person is like, just not like, if they, you know, that they're going to come up with a different view than everybody else, like you may want to articulate that um, expressly. And so it's not intended to offend, but it's intended to make sure that you receive the care and wishes um, that you would want. So, um. I'm going to flow through this really quickly. I, I always talk of the, the directive part, right? So how, what treatment decisions are important for this person, right? In your, or for you in your advanced directive. And I, I usually bring the schematic of a tree, a decision tree, a different type of decision tree. If you think of the roots of the tree, that's your health status or your prognosis. This is the most important part to establish. My goals as a young I consider myself still young, man, is much different than what my goals would be or my priorities would be when I'm 90, inshallah, right? And so having that information is first. Now, studies show that patients expect their doctors to bring up prognosis with them. Studies also show that doctors aren't the best at bringing this subject up. In fact, um, many, many doctors, when they do, overestimate what the prognosis is. That being said, I encourage family members or patients to ask the tough questions. Hey, doc, you've known me. You know what I'm dealing with. What can I expect for the future? How, what do you, can, is there anything you can tell me about my life expectancy or something like that? And sometimes they'll shy away from giving any, you know, answer, which is fine. I encourage people to focus not just on time, focus on function. Like, Hey, she's dealing with this. What does what is life going to look like in the future? That's also important. Um, now, at the branches of the tree are medical decisions, and I listed a lot of the end of life medical decisions that come up. And very often, very often, it goes from roots to tree in the context of you know modern medicine. A patient's in the hospital. Maybe they're incapacitated. They're developed. They're delivered this really devastating news about their diagnosis or the progression of their cancer or how bad the infection is. And then immediately the family is asked to pick a branch, like they're picking an appetizer from a menu at a restaurant. Like, what would you want? Or what would he want? Or And, and trees don't grow that way. And conversations shouldn't happen that way. Now, sometimes doctors and, and hospitals are pressed for time because things are really urgent, emergent. And these haven't been had in the past. The best way to avoid that, though, is to have these conversations before that point and focus on what the trunk of the tree is, your goals, your values, your priorities. So in my consults with my patients, if they're an hour long and I'm talking about medical decisions, 75%, maybe even more, is talking about the type of person they are, what's important to them, what makes life worth living for them, what hopes and worries they have, at the end, I use my clinical judgment and having known them, gotten to know them, to tell or recommend or guide uh, a patient and their family as to what branch makes most sense for their values and their goals. And as Muslims, our trunk is is huge. I mean, there is a wealth, uh, so much that we can derive from in our faith and our tradition about how end-of-life care should look like and what treatments um, make sense. Now, this is a good uh, point to make about seeking treatment and seeking medical treatment. It it makes its rounds around, you know, Islamic legal conversations and ethical conversations uh, in, in medicine, right? Is there an obligation to seek medical treatment? And there's a, a lot of difference of opinions and a lot of angles to address that question, right? Are we talking about, a lot of times it's couched in the uh, effect, efficacy of the treatment, right? Is there, is it, 
fairly certain that this treatment is going to help? Is it غلبت الظن? Is it presumptive that it would? Is it mohum? Is it just like throwing darts in the dark and seeing if it lands on a bullseye? And that drives the conversation as to whether or not seeking medical treatment can either be, you know, wajib to actually disliked, makruh, if it actually, you know, the harms outweigh the benefits. And that's the second piece, harm. You know, medical treatments in the past, they weren't as harmful as they are today. If I tell you about taking Tylenol, as a treatment for your pain or your fever, as long as you're under the 3,000 milligrams in a 24-hour period, it's a fairly safe drug. You're going to be fine. And so there's no harm, usually, no harm associated with taking Tylenol. If I'm talking about chemotherapy or CPR, then we got to also talk about harm. And uh, Rasulullah said, There's no, no harm shall be inflicted nor reciprocated in Islam. And that's the guiding principle in all ethics and in, in medical ethics and social and financial ethics for us as Muslims. And so we have to talk about it in the context of harm. I will uh, draw on uh, the sunnah here as well. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam was dealing with illness and we know he was in and out of consciousness um, uh, and, you know, falling asleep and, and waking up and falling asleep and waking up. In one of those moments, his family was gathered around him. And when I was reading this hadith, it's like a, a, a scene I see all the time in the hospital or or with at home where family is gathered, they're anxious, they're worried, and the patient is sick, their loved one is sick. And they're thinking, what do we do? What do we do? We have to do something. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually mentions this in the Quran, in Surah Al-Qiyamah. He says, when, Even as the soul is reaching its collarbones, the collarbones, and it's on its way out, the last moments of death, it will be said, who can provide a cure, right? Who can cure this? And that is an instinct, a good one to have as human beings to care for a loved one and seek treatment. And so this scene is with his family, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, around him. And they try to put a buckle medication in his mouth, right? And that's something we still do when you give a medicine inside the cheek uh, of a person, it's faster absorption. And he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, kind of declined it with his hand. And Aisha anha comments that it, they thought it was as if any patient hates medicine, right? Hates to take medicine. And so when he became too physically weak, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to actually decline it, they put it in his mouth. Uh, and when he woke up from that, he actually was upset and scolded them and asked, how, how would you like it if it was forced onto you? Now, of course, we don't have the divine knowledge that was imparted to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and so I don't want to use this as a dalil or, or anything like that as it comes to our own medical treatments. But I do uh, gain some guidance from that in saying that, you know, a person's ability to choose medications um, comes up. And also, just because we can provide medication doesn't always mean that we, or treatments, doesn't always mean we should, right? So there's a difference there. Ending on, on advanced care planning, you know, these are the questions that I love to ask. If you're ever on a first date, is what I say, and you really want to get to know a person, uh, these are the questions that really you get to know a person, right? What brings meaning and purpose to your life? What brings you joy? What, what makes life worth living? This is what I ask my patients. You know, that medical stuff is important. I read your chart. You know, I read your lab values. Tell me about your values uh, as a person. And that should really guide medical decisions, in my opinion, uh, rather than any medical data. So Rami, if, uh, I can, if I can interject yeah. here, there's uh, several questions to this point and several sort of anecdotal experiences, I think. One is, you know, you as the clinician in the moment, making a determination with the family, with the patient, perhaps that's easier, right? The question that's, I mean, people have been posting repeatedly here is also like, how do I do so in advance? Like how, when, and you'll come to this, I know, but just so that you have this frame of like, when is it appropriate to write a DNR, right? Mm -hmm. And, and how, what people think, you know, when does that border on, oh, you know, like don't, don't kill yourself and what's suicide and what is, um, some people say that, you know, you must, there's this misperception perhaps that you must seek every single intervention that is out there uh, mm -hmm. because otherwise you would be violating uh, that obligation of not harming yourself. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you can just kind of touch on as we go, the advanced part of it is what is trickier. And this is where I think so many of those directives 
are just too challenging for the average person to administer because they ask about specific interventions rather than these like how would you what would your goals be yeah. they're asking do you want cardiopulmonary resuscitation and do you want you know this to be you know on a ventilator or this or that so just wanted yeah. to like that that's a question that's coming up sort of as a repeated theme uh in the absolutely chat. i i probably i will come to that uh all those things that you mentioned though the, I often say, I, I usually use a picture of a crystal ball here, of a person holding a crystal ball. And there's a million and one ways your health is going to change. So it is impossible, and nor should you do this, you know, really think about like every single scenario that your health can change and what you would want in that scenario. I mean, you can derive some experiences from how your mother or your father less, you know, died or how dialysis was so bad on this person and how you would not want that. And you could share that. But advanced directives, you know, it's focus, it's vague. And I think that's good by design, right? Not not going to the specifics of everything. Because number one, like, like I said, your health can change in many ways. Number two, you can change. Like your, your goals can change when you're actually confronted with illness. I think the value of advanced directives more than anything else, and this is it here, the conversations that are happening between families to say, you know, this is my goals. This, if I'm ever tried by illness, I'm, if I'm, I'm ever dying, like this is what would be important to me, right? And actually having that conversation makes a very difficult situation, your loved one dying, a little less difficult. It won't make it easy, but it will make it a little less difficult. And I think that's really important. A post form here that I bring up in the continuum will come back to a bit later, but that's where the DNR question comes up. So, um, I'm going to go through the next two cases a little bit quickly because I think the end case is, is where uh, the DNR question comes up. Um, but I, I, I do uh, like this case because this highlights how Muslims might see their care a little differently in the context of modern Western medicine. This is a 57-year-old Muslim woman. She has bone in the cancer. It's osteosarcoma. And if anybody's had bone pain, may Allah protect us. It's, it's one of the worst types of pain that um, people can have. And despite radiation and treatments that are geared towards this bone pain, uh, she's still having pain. And so the doctor writes an opioid medication. I know opioids, uh, there's a lot of conversation around that. But the, this Muslim woman says, I do not want pain relief. I want Allah to forgive my sins. Now, redemptive suffering. We know this is rooted in Islamic tradition. Rasulullah so said them said, no, no thorn pricks the skin of a Muslim except that their sins are forgiven. Rasulullah told someone he was with when they were commenting on someone who died without being tried and called them fortunate. They said, Hani an lah, you know? And he said, Wayhaq. He admonished him and said, how would you to know that if, if he was tried by illness, Allah would have forgiven his sins, right? Um, physicians in this, and clinicians here uh, can be heavy-handed with uh, medications to relieve pain. Hospice uh, clinicians, especially who have seen opioids, and I've seen opioids, really help people from their pain and suffering at the end of life, and there is a place for them. They will have a hard time, right, uh, with someone that says, "I'd rather deal with the pain," while they're grimacing and and guarding and and wincing in pain. But it's something that is personal, and I honor that, right? If a person you know the morphine is there. It can help. You look like you're in pain. And if the person is their own determinant of how much pain relief and how much pain they'd want to go to, especially if it's rooted in religious uh, values like uh, ours is. Now, I, I have to say one thing, though, uh, and I've seen this, actually. You know, many some people will take this to mean that I'm going to sign on for aggressive or burdensome or really uh, painful interventions and hope for Allah to forgive my sins. That's not... Uh, I am okay in saying this, and this is me. That's not okay. I was in a, a talk where um, an Islamic scholar said that, you know, pursuing medical, or excuse me, mechanical ventilation and life support for patients who are, are brain dead, I know that's a huge conversation, uh, can be uh, uh, applied because Allah is forgiving that person of their sins. Ah, I, you know, again, going back to removal of harm, uh, right, is really important. We can't do that. Self-mutilation in hopes to Allah forgives our sins is not something in our in our uh, tradition. So there's a fine line by suffering from illness and then suffering from treatments, elective treatments. All right, this is this is a loaded one, um, and I have about probably around twenty minutes or so. Is that okay, yes, sir? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that's good. Uh, just there are several questions about you know the recording. 
So the recording will be available if you have to drop off. I know we have folks all over the country, and so it's Mavrib time, and it's you know different uh, <laughs> different time zones and such. Uh, but yeah, we'll aim, inshallah, to to get around 20 minutes. And then if we have some questions and answers, maybe we'll spend a few minutes after that, just so you have an expectation of uh, of timeline. Sure. Um, and this is, this is another case. Now, all these cases are actually rooted in real scenarios. I just changed the details. Uh, this is a 91-year-old patient, advanced dementia, admitted for an infection, end of life, goals of care conversation. What's important with what the family has had? And they say, just keep you know our, our mom comfortable for whatever time is left. Now, in the middle of the night, the nurse pages the Muslim doctor. So there's a Muslim doctor on call for an extra dose of the opioid medication because this patient is breathing really quickly. They look uncomfortable. They're using their muscles to, to breathe. You can see them struggling. And the Muslim pa doctor, excuse me, says, euthanasia is against my religion. I do not feel comfortable increasing the morphine or giving the morphine. And, and I've seen this with Muslim doctors here. Um, loaded topic with euthanasia. Uh, euthanasia actually comes from the Greek word eu, which is good, and thanatos, which means death. So good death. And I think it's misapplied. I mean, the, the, some people will talk about DNR orders or foregoing treatments as euthanasia or passive euthanasia. I think in what's more specific and in the context of today, euthanasia is usually just meant for medication administered with the intent to end someone's life. And that is legal in many countries around the world um, for patients with limited prognosis and some not even with limited prognosis. Uh, that's a whole other discussion to have. Um, uh, but uh, uh, with this, it's more about you know administering the medication to end someone's life. Now, what does our tradition share around relief of suffering and knowing that there may be an unintended consequence of hastening death? Morphine, just like, as you know, with the opioid crisis, in large doses, opioids will shut down the breathing center of the brain and cause someone to die. Right? That's how overdoses happen and lead to death. And so how do we reconcile relieving pain, suffering, breathlessness, especially at the end of life, with this theoretical and sometimes real um, risk of shortening someone's life? And this is where the principle of double effect comes in. I'm going to mention it because I do think there's a corollary within Islam. We know that that the, the uh, um, actions are judged by their intentions. And so the principle of double effect, just to, to mention it in lay, layman's terms, Thomas Aquinas, Catholic, Catholic doctrine, said if someone comes to your home and you're defending your home and you end up killing that person, is it a sin? Is it murder that you killed that person? And essentially the, doc, the double effect doctrine or principle says that no, if there was a, an action with a good intention and a negative unintended consequence occurs, it is still moral and accepted. And in the context of medicine, it's often used um, in what I just mentioned with morphine at the end of life. And I want to go through these conditions because I think the conditions are important. I think there's a, a, a fallacy on the part of clinicians sometimes when we're talking about really aggressive and burdensome and um, harmful treatments and say, oh, principle of double effect. I'm hoping for this good outcome, but you know this thing happened. It caused a lot of pain or complications for this patient. That's not how it works. There are conditions that have to make it valid. I know I'm getting a little technical here. I promise this is the technical part of the talk. The action in and of itself from its very object be good. So for the patient that we just mentioned, relief of pain and breathlessness at the end of life, I think we all can say is objectively, that's a good action. We want to relieve suffering. The good effect and not the evil effect be intended. We're not saying we're giving this medication to end this person's life. We're saying to, to relieve suffering. The good effect be not produced by the evil effect, meaning that we're not saying we are relieving suffering by ending this person's life. That would be unacceptable, right? And then lastly, a proportionally grave reason for permitting the evil effect. And I think suffering at the end of life and breathlessness is, is a pretty grave reason to um, provide these medications. Now, there's a fifth one uh, that I got from um, the, the article cited below. And I like this one, and I think it's overlooked many times, that the agents, the doctors, the clinicians, the nurses, strive to minimize the foreseen harm. You know, for me as a doctor, I, I give morphine all the time. And I know the pharmacokinetics, how morphine is absorbed in the body, when it reaches its peak effect, how much to give, how much to increase each time. I'm not just giving it willy-nilly. 
right? And I'm I'm monitoring that so that I uh, am trying my best to strike the balance between pain relief or relief of suffering and pain and breathlessness and causing unintended negative consequences. So there is room here. I do think as Muslims, there is room to relieve suffering at the end of life with medications like morphine, uh, as long as conditions, of course, are met. Okay, I have one more case to go through, and this is where DNR comes up. Uh, and this was, I think, the most eye-opening case uh, for me in my own professional development. This was a, a Muslim woman came from a long flight from overseas and developed shortness of breath during the flight. As soon as she touched down, she was redlined to the uh, emergency room and was found to have a massive clot in her lungs and was in respiratory failure. So her lungs weren't working. And she was on something called BiPAP, which is non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, a mask to force air in and out. So it's the step before life support when the tube goes down the windpipe and you're hooked to a ventilator. So palliative care was consulted for code status. And code status means that what you touched on a second ago, yes. Yeah, so, um, code status is whether or not to resuscitate. So how I like to say it is if a person dies, essentially, if there's no pulse, person's not breathing, do we do CPR in efforts to resuscitate the heart and to, of course, look, hook them up to a ventilator and life support? Or do we not attempt to do that? And Often it's called on the form, it's called allow a natural death. I think that's a loaded term and kind of skews, maybe uh, persuades one person one way or the other. But those are the terms that are used. Um, pulling another study, it's really important to know how what code status means. When we go to get chemotherapy, we ask about all the side effects and all the intended outcomes for it. And so for patients 65 years or older uh, in the hospital, and so when you're in the hospital, uh, this is a good, actually, a clear point of clarification. You're sick, right? So I say CPR is, is a, a great intervention that human beings have developed. Um, we saw DeMar Hamlin, for example, last year, a football player, an NFL football player, collapse on a field and was resuscitated to where he now he's catching interceptions and playing on the field again today. That's amazing, right? Um, CPR works when the heart fails and it's trying to take the body with it. So he suffered a fatal arrhythmia because someone shoved their helmet into their heart in the wrong time of the heart rhythm. And the heart was trying to go and take the body with it. And that's where it's effective, all right? Where it's not effective is when the body's trying to go and then taking the heart with it. So with advanced cancer and organs are failing and, and bodies failing and the last thing to go is the heart, that's when CPR and resuscitation tends to not work <laughs> as well as we think. Um, in this study, 49% of the people in the hospital never even made it through the resuscitation. So we're already coin flipping at this point. Uh, another 34% uh, percent never left the hospital. So you can presume the majority of those are on life support and end up dying on life support, usually sedated in the ICU. Um, seven died within one year of discharge. So they got a year out of it. And another 10 were alive one year after discharge. So those are the numbers there. So to me, that, to oh. me, that just kind of reiterates the point about like revisiting these directives as life changes, right? Like the the healthy prognosis sounds like, you know, you're young and you would want the inter intervention and the same intervention if it's going to cause a whole bunch of broken ribs and all sorts of other problems that are going to come. At that point, you would want the directive to say something different. So this is sort of just like a state, I mean, just like the, the, the estate plan might change, the directive probably should change over the course of one's life, right? If we're thinking about it from an advanced perspective. Absolutely. And that's why you have to always revisit periodically, right? Your estate plan and your advanced directive. One, one question I have as you're going through this, uh, another term that, uh, uh, that I think is confusing is uh, there's one that I don't want any heroic measures. Yeah. So what does that mean? You know, I... It, Medicine, I, I can I can give a whole talk on language in medicine because uh, that's that's a lot of what I do and and I think medicine with language, uh, unfortunately, we we hear these these euphemisms, these adjectives that really skews uh, you know the the full picture right heroics colloquially is is usually meant this right like life support and aggressive interventions. Hell Marys where, you know, you don't know if it's going to work or not and can cause a significant amount of harm, life support. That's usually what it's meant. 
Um, but it, just using the word heroics, I mean, what does that actually mean, right? Same with, for example, comfort care. Right? That's something that comes up often. People on comfort care sometimes are not comfortable because their disease is so serious. But, you know, comfort might sound better when we bring it up. Doctors sometimes ask, do you want us to do everything possible? And for a person who's sick or, you know, a daughter was with her father who's sick and comes to the ER looking for treatments, you say, of course, do everything possible. What does that mean? Right. And so that's a whole different discussion topic and something I do on my day to day to really you know, spend time like peeling the onion, the layers on the onion to really know what is meant and what is important for that person. And what about, what about, I know you're going to get to this, but what about the, the first responder, right? As you come to this, yeah, on this post form, like when they see something like how likely that's different, you're in the hospital, like, you know, that, that you, you've already gotten there, but if that DNR is on the fridge, um, mm -hmm. how, how does that change the analysis? Because a, a, a question we get all the time is like, okay, so I did this directive, like who knows about it? Where is it? Where is it stored? How do we ensure that it actually has some efficacy? And, you know, if you listen to the old sort of advice, it was like, put a copy on your fridge and, you know, that kind of stuff. And obviously now there's, there's digital versions of this, but if you couldn't, yeah, I guess this is a perfect segue into that, into that. It is. It is a great segue. Um, this is the pulse form. Every state has a pulse form. There are little variations. I looked up Arizona's. This is very similar to California's. It's a hot pink form. And the reason it's hot pink is because it can be found uh, in the time of an emergency fairly easily. Um, yes, patients, families are, are usually told to put it on their fridge because that's where paramedics and EMS are trained to look. Um, I often tell people that if you don't want to look at it every time you reach for a snack, put it on the side of the fridge <laughs> so uh, and they'll know to look. Uh, and the default in this country, for better or for worse, without this form, is to do CPR. So if paramedics come in and don't see this form, and there's a lot of defensive medicine happening, you know, fear of being liable, they will do CPR. Uh, unless there is a physician's order, and this is what it looks like, to not do CPR. An advanced directive, sorry, paramedics are not going to comb through, you know, five pages of an advanced directive to figure out whether or not to put, uh, com you know, put do chest compressions. This is the form they look at. Uh, and the main question on this form is letter A, do we do CPR or not if there's no pulse? Um, I do, I know I brought up statistics. I do have to bring up personal stories, and I know we're 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 swayed by by personal stories and storytelling, but they're effect they're effective. I you know I have a loved one in my own family and who I really implored to try to get this post form done, and unfortunately did not for you know an older woman in our family who was dementia and and clearly in her last months of life, and when she coded, you know the EMS showed up with doing code status. My uh, her son showed up shortly thereafter. And at 20 minutes of doing this, um, my uncle implored them to just stop. And um, yeah, it was my uncle and uh, implored them to stop. And this is not founded, at least from what I looked and yes, or you can help me out here. And he found it in any law or legal code, but he was told that we have to do it for at least 30 minutes before we uh, say no. And I've seen mixed things in practice from paramedics. And she got her pul uh, pulse back uh, in 25 minutes but was completely neurologically gone. My eyes dilated, gag reflex, but now she's on a ventilator and the family has to decide whether or not to withdraw the ventilator. Now the questions are being asked, like in this webinar, what does the SNAM say? And all the while we could have had these conversations ahead of time, right? And I don't fault the family. I fault more the doctors. Like the doctors really need to initiate these conversations and share uh, what's, what's important um, and what they would recommend uh, for patients. So that's we the have a lot of doctors. We actually have a lot of doctors on the, on this, uh, webinar. Oh, good. Uh, one point, uh, you know, you mentioned this point about defensive medicine. And so that drives so much of how medicine is practiced. Obviously insurance drives a huge portion of how medicine is practiced and who has, and who doesn't, and what treatment they receive and all that. But this defensiveness of plaintiff's attorneys does. And I was actually reading, um, interestingly, there are now wrongful life lawsuits for failure to wow. adhere to the directive. So the inverse, mm. um, where now the physician has to be cognizant of the directive because plaintiff's attorneys have brought wrongful life lawsuits 
um, given the suffering that somebody would potentially have because of the intervention. And so it just makes, obviously, the, the trickiness of medicine um, even greater. Poor doctors. Yeah. Caught in the middle, right? <laughs> um, so that's that's the pulse form in, in DNR. Now, I'm coming back to this to, to conclude. I'm, co I'm coming back to this case um, because I think this is a good um, place to kind of put all of this in a, in a basket, right, and, and gift wrap it because uh, we're human beings, right? So the son who comes as this conversation around code status comes to the hospital and he's a physician in Saudi and a family meeting is held around it. And he says, in my religion, we must do everything possible. If we must intubate, then intubate. We see this all the time, right? I'm consulted sometimes by people in the community or in my family and, you know, the imam or someone says, Islam says to do everything, right? Um, now, what does that say? And, and, uh, about withholding and withdrawing life-sustaining treatments, what what does our religion or our scholarship in our religion say? I, I hate to say, I hate the phrase, what does Islam say? Because the scholars of Islam say a lot of things and it's one of the the na'am of a, our, our faith that there's ikhtilaf and, and difference of opinions. And there's a study here uh, that kind of highlighted some of the fiqh councils around the world. Uh, Imana as well as listed as, as there, giving their um, uh, ideas around this. And you look at some of these things and they're, they're usually vague, right? Like if no chance of survival, is there always, can someone truly say there's always a no chance of survival? What does survival mean in that context? Um, terminally ill, okay. Brain death. And that's a conversation that we won't really get into today, but uh, what does that mean? Um, Imana was probably the more specific one that said persistent vegetative state uh, uh, where you can withhold or withdraw. But what you have here with these fifth councils, and I like to highlight this because this is really important, is you know three uh, parties that come to medical decisions, especially if a patient stays on life support at the end of life, dead by neurological criteria, what to do. Autonomy is king in the in the Western uh, medicine, which means that's the driving principle of ethics. What does the patient or family want? Um, informed consent. It's and then there's a rich history, and we can talk about this, yes, in a future webinar, about cases in the United States, legal cases that went up to the Supreme Court to really drive this idea of informed consent and autonomy and away from paternalistic medicine. Now, Muslim patients, I don't care if you've never prayed a rak'ah in your life, if you are met with death, the family will inevitably uh, ask the religious questions because we're meeting Allah, right? So, what, how, what would you, what are we supposed to do? So they'll go to these councils maybe, right? And say, what does Islam say? What, what, what is the scholarship out there? And we just saw on the previous slide that the councils deferred a, a lot of clinical judgment, right? Brain death, no chance of survival, terminally ill. Who's best to answer those questions? Usually a clinician. And on top of that, what muddies the picture is usually a family member. And it's never the family member that's with patients at every clinic visit. It's the family member who flies in, to visit Ammo and oh no, someone in our community, their doctors told them that they were going to die, had the same thing and six years later they're working. Don't believe what they say. Throws a wrench in all the conversations that are happening. On the other side, there are ethics committee in hospitals and I chair the ethics committee in our hospital. When sometimes doctors feel moral distress at providing some treatment that's non-beneficial and there are non-beneficial treatment protocols where ethics committee meet and sometimes make a decision against what the families say um, and they have an appeal process that they can go to and try to find another hospital good luck and that makes it more hairy and then on top of that what yes i mentioned a second ago the imam the local imam this poor local imam i mean custodian of a masjid fundraiser teaches our kid quran nikah and funeral processions and then we got to talk about brain death and life-sustaining treatments with them and some are brazen and will say you know an opinion and some, I remember I, the first time I gave this talk, subhanAllah, I was in Los Angeles and the imam of the masjid that I gave the talk to, and it was a terrible talk, I usually say, because it's my first time giving it. And he gets like, eyes this big and says, I have this community member calling me about X, Y, and Z. What do I tell her? He didn't know, right? This is messy. We want to avoid this. I know I want to avoid this at the end of my life. And the way to do it, I think, is to really uh, have these conversations before things get hairy to sit down with family to know, you know, what's important to them and their values. So uh, five more minutes. I I 
remember myself in this case because I had just come, you know, I was doing this research and reading and and Saudi had a fatwa in the 80s that probably was the most specific around life-sustaining treatments. And um, they deemed that a patient is unfit if three trustworthy Muslim doctors say that the disease is unresponsive to treatment and death certain or state of mental inactivity, untreatable brain damage, or resuscitation would be ineffective. Still some vague points there and, and hard to tell, right? It's always gray, but at least more specific than the others. So I thought, this guy's practicing in Saudi. Like he knows, he's a physician, right? And I try to bring it up with him. Oh, my, mind you, in the fatwa, it says that you don't need to turn to the opinions of the family because it's not their expertise. And they talk about provision and withdrawal of life-supporting treatments. And so I bring this up and I'm like, yeah, you know, I got this in my back pocket. Uh, I'm a Muslim palliative care clinician. I, I have all the hats. I check all the boxes. And he just tells me, look, I'm the doctor in the family. And I don't want to be the one to see him seen as the one who decided our mother should die. Gut punch, right? For me, a huge gut punch. And I knew then it, it's much broader than fiqh, than what does Islam say, right? We're human beings. We're grieving, emotional. And I think we could say that our community doesn't do very well with emotional processing, especially in light of all the mistrust in healthcare and in medical institutions, founded medical mistrust, uh, mistrust against healthcare institutions. But uh, this is the part where I say that if we spent just like half of the time uh, talking about planning and religious scriptures and, and fiqh and all ethics, and I think that's all important just to deal with grief and emotions and how we do with that in our family, I think we would all be better off, right? And we would all be much better off. And so that's a good place to end. Yeah, so you might have a couple questions that come up, but before you do, I just wanted to highlight the objectives. We talked about difference of palliative care and hospice, palliative care, not always end of life care, hospice is, um, the four qualities that make a good surrogate decision maker, right? Uh, they know that they are, they're reachable, they know your wishes, they can act on them. We talked about redemptive suffering and harm and autonomy and Islam. Hopefully you know the difference between advanced directives and pulsed forms, a physician order in one, a legal form in, in another, um, and they're not mutually exclusive and they're different things. And then lastly, we talked about uh, our beloved Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his, the practices at the end of his life. Um, so with that, I want to leave this slide up for a second because, uh, and I'm sure yes, that you probably have a question or two that we can touch on. Yeah, absolutely. No, Jazakallah khairan. Uh, I mean, absolutely uh, beneficial. I learned a lot and I'm sure everybody here uh, would echo that. Um, you know, there's so much to digest. And one of the things that we don't want is to have sort of this decision paralysis as as one of the takeaways, like, oh, it's too, it's too complicated. I mean, I think your point about at a minimum creating a directive to designate the agent, right? Like even if we're not super clear on the specific interventions and the, you know, what's appropriate or not, if at a minimum, like we designate people that we think are the most competent, upright, intelligent, objective, a responsive to your point about the four, you know, uh, things that you look for, I think at least we can be confident that that person will then consult with the right people and make the right decisions. Certainly having those conversations, articulating them, I think is very important. And one of the things that I find uh, the most useful about sort of that advanced directive uh, is to eliminate the sort of feeling of guilt that is associated that the decision maker has that you articulated, like that burden, whether it's burden or guilt. Um, if someone had articulated that in advance, then it mitigates the possibility we actually had a case where, you know, family members came and told one of the people who was a physician and also was an heir uh, that you're trying to kill this relative so you can inherit their money. I mean, talk about like the most uh, just offensive things you could say to someone as their parent is passing. And, you know, uh, the relative flies in from out of state and says you're trying to kill your parent to take their money or whatever. Right. Just even though, and then that, then then the parent ended up with tremendous suffering afterwards, in you know, uh, in in, turn, in 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 a home that was, you know, just so very difficult situations. I think can be mitigated by the agent selection, and then uh, addressing them. And I think hopefully, as we said, we'll uh, we have a goal to to enhance the directive. We do directives. So one of the reasons that we have this slide here is that, uh, as I mentioned at the outset, the advanced directive, which 
we didn't really talk about, but it com it contains a few different documents. So the Advanced Healthcare Directive and the Living Will in some states are two different documents, and in some states they are one document. So one designating the agent, the other designating the specific instruction. And then part of that directive, we didn't get a chance to talk about this today on this rich uh, conversation, uh, but organ donations. I mean, I get that question every single time we start the conversation is what does Islam say about organ donations? I mean, who's Islam, right? Um, as you mentioned. And so, uh, so that's part of it. And then that directive talking about sort of post-death wishes with respect to one's body. I mean, alhamdulillah, within Muslim communities, we generally have an understanding that um, everybody gets an Islamic burial, whistle, janaza, uh, et cetera. But it's important to memorialize that as well, especially for converts, right? Yeah. I think it's critical that that's articulated. I had one person come to me and said, my mom said, you know, burial, uh, funerals are for the living, not for the dead. It was a convert. And they were like, I've got to write down my wishes. Otherwise, they're going to bury me as a non-Muslim. Um, so things about, you know, not having an autopsy making sure that you know your wishes on organ donations are clear and then inshallah that'll be a separate topic of its own and then yeah. post-death what happens to the body all the karama what i could karamna bani adam right all of those discussions are based on notions of karama um so we'll, we'll talk about all of that i want to thank you uh so much for for all of this information as i mentioned if you'd like help with preparing your directive um reach out we'd be happy to connect and talk to you about that um, there are lots of resources online as well in different forms. And then, as I said, our goal, uh, I want all of you to make dua uh, for that is to really be able to develop a service that can provide a directive that is kind of one that you can create by yourself that is valid and legal in all 50 states that will guide you through the interview process, um, similar to some of the other ones that are available online, but from a unique Islamic perspective to address these um these considerations. Um, let me just run through a few of the questions. Uh, and I, I, I'm looking at the questions and, um, you know, I couldn't look at the questions while I was speaking, but so many questions and it opens up so many discussion points um, on the concept of DNR. I know that came up a bit, you know, I, I attended a lecture from a scholar because DNR in and of itself for any practicing physician here, you can't call it certain, right? And often for most people where it actually happens, it's it's actually more on the mahum, the 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 speculative side of things or coin flip side of things. And using the efficacy of DNR and um whether or not it's mandated to 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 actually pursue it, you can say that potentially that it's never mandated because of the speculative nature of whether or not one will survive the actual intervention. Um, the other point that someone brought up, and, and this breaks my heart to read, because DNR shouldn't mean let me die. It doesn't mean that. It means when I die, allow that to have happened without any chest compressions in my support. But it does sometimes get misconstrued by physicians and clinicians of, oh, this person would not want any medical treatment, which is farther from the case. And I've had conversations with with physicians and clinicians to say, no, I mean, DNR doesn't mean they don't get antibiotics or, or don't receive the good care that you need to. So it's unfortunate. And I think DNR orders is just one piece, right? We talked about racial inequities and things like that too, where family members have to be fierce advocates for patients when they interface with healthcare. I wish it wasn't so, but that's the reality of, of where things are. Um, yeah. I don't know if you have anything else, yes, that you were looking at. Uh, no, uh, we will, inshallah, um, upload the recording so that if you weren't able to catch all of it or you want to share it with um, others that you think could benefit, you'll certainly be able to do that. Uh, I do think, uh, you know, this is, inshallah, the start of a conversation that we'll, we will hopefully continue and that uh, can provide some benefit and resources for folks as they navigate something that's going to impact all of us, um, yeah. either as the patient or as the decision maker or as a relative, you know, in some capacity or another, like this will touch every single person. Um, and, you know, obviously, unfortunately, we're not gonna be able to cover every question here, but. Uh, Can I ask, answer one more? Yes. Yeah, please go I'm ahead. Coming, I think. Uh, way over time, but uh, I'm having fun here. <laughs> it's a great conversation. EOLOA, so End of Life Option Act. This is something that's legal in, in a few states. I think it's seven states in DC or eight states in DC where a physician 
um, through a number of process can uh, prescribe medications to someone with a limited prognosis to take, and they have to be of sound mind and body to take this medication to end their own lives. Uh, so they drink a medication to end their own lives. And um, I've had patients who've pursued this. I cannot um, reconcile from what I've read and what I've been taught and what I know uh, that something like this can uh, find its place as Islamically sound or valid. Um, uh, relief of pain and suffering. And we talked about the principle of double effect and how that might lead to an unintended consequence. This is with the intention to end one's life. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's a, a line there that I just want to make sure be clear about, at least from my understanding. Allah knows best. Appreciate appreciate that. Um, so let me change the directive. Is it possible to have the directive have different situations? I mean, certainly one can attempt to create a directive that has a bunch of contingencies and situations. I think that's a little bit hard. Um, and one should change. I will mention this point that perhaps the three most famous cases mm. in American legal system around end of life dealt with people under the age of 30, right? So not what one would expect with respect to end, you know, elderly, but rather young, healthy people, otherwise, or perhaps with, in, in some cases with a disease, um, but under 30, where two loved ones have very competing um, perspectives, right? And that leads to, uh, you know, courts making determinations, right? The, the worst possible result you can sort of arrive at is not even a healthcare facility and the doctors, but rather a judge, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of the, 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 the family. So uh, no one's too young, I think, for a directive. Uh, I think that's- 18, 18 years old. So 18 years old. Oh, yeah. you know, one last thing actually, um, this came up as well, which is to say, not necessarily end of life, but one of the other use cases for directives is that, uh, or, or for, a, for a healthcare power of attorney here, and I use this in the broader sense compared to the directive, but designating an agent, is that parents don't automatically have decision-making authority for their college-aged children. Mm -hmm. And so we've had that come up. So in the absence of a healthcare power of attorney under HIPAA, the parent who, you know, has been obviously doing everything for their child who now went off to college doesn't have the right to make decisions for their child who they think is a child, but is 19 years old and off in college. And so, and then I've, we've seen heartbreaking, broken families where the, 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 the parent is not able to make decisions uh, where they need to, because they didn't have a healthcare power of attorney. And so I think that's another use case just to designate the agent. If you have kids who are 18, um, make sure that that is part of one's planning. Yeah. So, so, yeah, I don't think we can talk about all these specific scenarios. There are some things that we, you know, I think would be useful. You know, we didn't talk about organ transplantation today. Uh, and we didn't also talk about artificially administered nutrition and what the Western kind of viewpoint versus the Islamic viewpoint is on that. So there are some big themes that maybe can be built into one, but um, we can't go through every every scenario. On top of that, I love that good advanced directives has a blank sheet uh, mm -hmm. at the end, as a letter to uh, whoever it is that's going to be called to make your decision, right? Like giving them words of comfort. I know I would want to do that for my son if he were ever, you know, called to make a decision for me in the future. Um, so that's also a good practice as well.